People in the Louisville area, um, while on the, on the one hand they, they, we have some awareness of, of these matters, um, I was just wondering if it were possible for you, there's so many different anecdotes and there's so many mm -hmm. different stories and then there's the whole third world and, and, the, right. dr and, the, and drug war outside mm -hmm. of the United States and, and there's so many different com aspects that you go into uh, in drug crazy. Uh, I wonder if you could just pretend, if you will, uh, that you were going to present a capsule of, of, of the book of, uh, in whatever way, you know, well, and I know you can't sum it up in a minute, but the things that are most salient, that, you know, that you would want to say, this is what, I mean, we have a lot of a blue collar workforce. We have many things in Louisville. We have the yeah. Kentucky Derby. We have the Louisville <laughs> Cardinals. We have, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Muhammad Ali. <laughs> True enough. But, uh, uh, you know, I, what I'm saying is I, I know uh, uh, there's many meetings going on and I don't want to keep you, mm -hmm. but uh, at the same time, you know, I'm interested in, in what you would most like to, to uh, you know, tell in terms of, of your book. Where would you, would, where you would uh, see? Like, like I didn't even tell any background, you know, about your mm -hmm. engineering background or the research you've done for the mm -hmm. book. In other words, there's so many things that that we could go into. Yet yeah, you're right. you're on a time schedule, and so. Uh, well, the. Uh, uh, I would say, Pat, that the the most one of the most disturbing things about uh, uh, what I discovered in this uh, is the destruction that the drug war is accomplishing to the country. In other words, the destruct the the, uh, the erosion of the Bill of Rights, for example, uh, the U.S. Constitution as a result of drug war exceptions that the Supreme Court has agreed on, you know, where they consider drugs to be such a terrible issue that they're willing to bend the Constitution or cut a hole through it. And the Constitution now looks as riddled as the flag over Fort Sumter. Uh, uh, the whole uh, sections of the right to privacy, the right to, I mean, uh, we, we're constantly reading uh, stories about, uh, you know, this minister in Boston who has a heart attack because a bunch of uh, guys in ninja costumes break down the door in the middle of the night. Uh, they had the wrong address. Unfortunately, the minister is still dead. Uh, in uh, Los Angeles, We just a few weeks ago, we had a grandfather in a house on the west side. Uh, they broke down the door. He goes running into the bedroom and uh, uh, the cops chase him into the bedroom and, he, and he's down kneeling on the bed and they shoot him in the back three or four times. Uh, it was the wrong address. You know, uh, all this is being done in the name of, uh, of uh, fighting drugs. And yet, the interesting thing is, um, every year we see that drugs are cheaper, more available, and being used by younger and younger kids. I mean, uh, and harder drugs. Well, yeah. I mean, 10 years ago, we'd never even heard of teenage heroin users. You know, I mean, that's a shot. And yet General McCaffrey, our drug czar, says that's the fastest growing category in the whole spectrum of drug use, teenage heroin users. That's what we've managed to accomplish by prohibition. And the thing that sticks in my mind, you're asking for a salient moment in the book. The, uh, during, at the end of alcohol prohibition, alcohol prohibition was, it was ended by the women, the very people who had instituted alcohol, helped get alcohol prohibition underway in the first place. And they had a change of heart sometime about 10 years into it, uh, when they realized that the violence and the gunplay and the corruption that was simply eating the country alive uh, had, had overwhelmed any hope of any positive accomplishment. And I happened to come across a speech by a woman named Pauline Sabin. Pauline Morton Sabin. Morton is uh, uh, from the Salt Mortons, you know, so she came from real serious money. And uh, her husband was the head of the Mellon Bank in Philadelphia, you know. Uh, she was a mover and shaker. She was the first woman elected to the, Re to the Republican National Committee after women got the vote. Powerful political figure. And I came across a speech that she delivered to the House of Representatives on February the 13th, 1930. This is three years before alcohol prohibition ended. And she said, 
uh, like many women uh, in this country, I believed that a uh, world without alcohol would be a beautiful world. Uh, I have two young sons, and I certainly did not want them to grow up in the filth and corruption of the saloon. But I have come to realize, with heart burning and heart aching, that in our effort to make prohibition as strong as the Constitution, we have managed to make the Constitution as weak as prohibition. She said, before prohibition, my children had no access to alcohol. Now they can get it anywhere. I don't think that you can get a better uh, uh, indictment of the concept of prohibition than that, and it certainly resonates with our experience right now. Um, drugs are so available, and the chances are they'll deliver, and when they deliver, it's quite likely to be a 16-year-old. Mm -hmm. One, 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 one small point I want to make about your book that, that I wasn't aware of uh, as a physician, and uh, personally I believe that many physicians are, uh, are in spirit, uh, in, in correspondence with, with the movement, uh, but it's a difficult position yes, you know, right. to, you know, to be in sure. from a certain well, right. historical perspective, and that's the very point that your book made is that up until a certain point of time, physicians used to be able, in other words, it was within their domain to treat uh, addicts uh, with, uh, let's say someone addicted to narcotics or whatever, a, a physician could simply give them a prescription and treat them or maintain them or help them withdraw from it. And then there right. was a specific act of legislation that made it uh, illegal, if you will, for a, for a physician to, to prescribe, say, a painkiller for anything mm -hmm. other than specific pain. And in other right. words, a whole new bureaucracy was created, and in doing so, the the, uh, the physician atten attention to you know to, to treatment was was simply splintered off. Yes. You know, to where we right. were, we as physicians were more and more discouraged to, to not really have anything to do with with addicts or you yeah. know with right. with addiction issue. And uh, anyway, all right. Uh, well, listen, I've got to okay. run. Okay. Patrick, one, and I appreciate one, one thing I sure. want to say is didn't 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 Drug Crazy just come out in, in paperback? Yes, uh, it uh, was published in hardcover by uh, Random House in '98. And uh, next month uh, is, uh, well, uh, February of uh, 2000, it will be available uh, from Routledge uh, in paperback. It's a nice edition. I just saw it yesterday. I got the first copy. And that'll be in, nice in most bookstores? Should be in Amazon, most bookstores. And it'll certainly be on Amazon.com. And they, uh, they'll overnight it to you. So, yeah. uh, And the price is now down in the paperback, so $14.95, which is a better deal. Right. Okay. Thanks very much. Thanks a lot. Okay. On behalf of Kenex and many other people got involved, Norman was extremely helpful. Uh, the hemp industry responded. We had a meeting in Canada already scheduled, and it was great timing. All the major players came together, and we spent three days discussing what our strategy would be. We established a website, hempembargo.com, to explain to people what the latest terms of the situation were. And uh, we, we fought, but our fighting was minuscule compared to what happened in Canada, where their farmers who would just take their, their farms and their industries who would work with themselves and everybody else, the government who had depended on this and, and really pushed the farmers and the industries into this as a development machine, uh, reacted strongly. And the Canadian embassy here in Washington, D.C. gets a special thanks a pat on the back for reacting quickly and strongly and making this an international incident. The United States <laughs> United States uh, State Department heard from the government of Canada, hey, we're already fuss uh, fussing over fishing rights, we're already fighting over tribal Indian treaties and 20 other things. Don't put this one on the table because we're going to fight ferociously on it. And the United States government, U.S. Customs, had to back down in the end. They didn't get any backup from the DEA. Uh, we first heard about it in November, but we didn't get official word in writing on it until December 7th that this was over.